I'm Professor David Wilson. As a criminologist, I'm often asked, what's it like to interview a murderer? Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is audio taped. To answer this question, I'm going to take you on a journey into the dark heart of the police interrogation room. Using cutting edge lip sync technology, we'll bring to life the actual taped confessions of some of the world's most notorious killers. I put tape on her mouth, help that there so she couldn't breathe. And bring you face to face with evil. I felt sick looking at him, knowing what he did. And along with forensic psychologist, Professor Michael Brooks, I'll analyze their interviews in unparalleled detail. Her skull gave way a little bit. She was there immediately unconscious. Their wicked words, now seen spoken for the very first time, will never be forgotten. So I didn't suggest to him that we kill her on Sunday, but I knew that she, I knew that she had to be gone. The interview in today's episode is a master class in the use of the read technique model of police interviewing adopted in the United States and Canada. In the read technique, interviewing is an accusatory process where the investigator tells the suspect that the results of their investigation clearly indicates that they did indeed commit the crime in question. The interviewee is a young woman, the suspect in a crime that shocked Canada. A respectable middle-class family had been gunned down in their homes. The mother lay dead, the father fighting for his life, and their terrified daughter found tied to a banister upstairs. Was this a home invasion or a robbery gone wrong? Or was the truth of the crime to be found far closer to home, a home where the daughter fell under immense pressure to be a success by her overbearing parents? The police had many questions, but no answers, and the daughter's account of the night was proving to be of little help. Then they had the breakthrough they needed. Unbeknown to the girl, her father had survived the attack. When he woke up from a three-day coma, he told investigators details of the home invasion that left his daughter under suspicion. He said that he saw her talking to one of the men like a friend, and that her arms weren't even tied behind her back while she was being led around the house. After initial questioning, the girl was turned over to Detective Bill Geats, Gator as he was known around the police force. Geats is an experienced interviewer and cold and calculating almost from the get-go. He clearly means business and identifies the girl's manipulative tendencies immediately. He plays both good cop and bad cop, a dual role with which he seems entirely at ease. His interview will contain a series of outright lies, which is part of the read technique. Over the many hours she sits before him, Geats relentlessly breaks his interviewee down and eventually brings about an admission from the girl that she had ordered the hit on her family. Who is this killer who felt that the pressure to be perfect by her parents was enough to warrant their murder? Jennifer Pan. Exactly two weeks after Jennifer Pan's mother, Bisha Pan, was killed by gunmen and her father, Han Pan, was shot and wounded, Jennifer faced questioning by York Regional Police in Canada. She claimed she was the lone victim left standing in the home invasion at her Markham residence on November the 8th, 2010. The police were suspicious 
but had little evidence. So today's the 9th of November, 2010. You're in a room right now that's uh, being audio recorded. So if you can identify yourself for me. My name is Jennifer Pan. Jennifer Pan's parents had emigrated from Vietnam to Canada and they had built their life from the ground up. They had worked so hard for everything they had and they wanted Jennifer to do well in life and they had wanted for her to become a doctor. She's been given all the opportunities to succeed but academically she's challenged. She can't actually meet those expectations and as a result of that and the fear of failing in a parent's eyes, she then begins to spin a web of deceit and lies. She made this very early decision to start to create a new reality. She wanted to keep it from her parents. She started to forge her report cards and give herself so she got, looks like she had straight A's. Um, and then once she was on that journey, that train, there was no getting off. She faked it for years, getting straight A's. She claimed to have a place at university. The university uh, declined to take her because she didn't match her entrance requirements. She went to enormous lengths to maintain that facade. She'd go and get books on pharmacology and also look at YouTube or clips on, on videos to get her write up lecture notes to show her parents. She even uh, claimed to have graduated from uh, the University of Toronto and got an uh, internship at the Children's Hospital, a very stiff competition to get a place. So of course her parents were very proud of her. Actually she was working as a waitress and she was teaching piano to other children. When there's so much pressure to achieve, as there was with, with Jennifer Pan, this pressure takes the form not just of uh, a focus to her life, uh, a central goal to her life, it becomes actually the only reality she knows. So the only way that she understands, evaluates herself uh, and her life, her whole existence, is against the measure of achievement that her parents present for her. In somebody young and vulnerable, this, this goes beyond just producing a sense of being stressed. It actually defines their whole world. Um, uh, and I think we see this with, with the way in which um, Jennifer saw her only possible response to, to failure was, was to do everything she could to conceal it. When her family found this out, they were so angry at her and she had to explain that actually she'd failed the exam she needed. Basically, um, all hell broke loose at family home. Her father apparently wanted to throw her out and was disgraced and everything else. It also emerged that she had a boyfriend, Daniel uh, Wong, who she'd known for many years from school days. Her parents insisted that she, A, she gave up the boyfriend, B, that she completed a high school education, and C, that she became a much more dutiful daughter and restricted her very much in her social life so that she wasn't allowed to go out. She was very much confined to home or to work. She ended up staying with her family and she tried to not have any contact with Daniel, but it's very evident that this wasn't the case. The two did continue to talk and did continue to have a relationship. But because it was a secret, Daniel then found someone else and he fell in love with another girl. And this really sent Jennifer into a bit of a depression over the kind of pressure she was getting from her parents and the kind of constraints she had on her life. She's clearly a young woman who was living this double life because of the sort of stern parenting that she'd, she'd had from her, her mother and father. Um, and so early on you can understand and sympathise with her to some extent that she's, she's obviously really been put through the ringer by this relationship in which she's kind of expected to achieve so much all the time. Um, and from her point of view, you, you feel that it's probably not a very loving relationship that she has with her parents. On the other hand, uh, the way she managed, tries to escape from this relationship in the end is, is, is quite chilling and, and cold. Um, we are investigating a murder. 
Do you understand the criminal consequences of making a false statement? Yes. Do you understand the importance of telling the truth? Yes, I do. Okay, so this isn't suspecting that you're not going to tell the truth. This is more of a feature that you understand the importance of telling the complete truth. You have nothing to apologize to me for, Jennifer. I, it's going to be tough. I'll get you some Kleenex in a second, okay? Now I want you to sort of take yourself back to earlier on today, uh, yesterday. When she's first taken in, she, she comes across quite well, I think, and, and she cuts a sympathetic figure. Um, she's tearful. She doesn't look like the sort of person that would be able to engineer this, this kind of crime. But when you think about it again, she's also a person who's been leading a double life for several years and been lying to her parents about her grades at, at school and then lying about the fact that she was at university She'd, she'd mounted a whole uh, fictitious life for herself. So to some extent, it's not that surprising that she would be fairly convincing in the initial stages of the interrogation process. My mom came home, I believe that was around 9.30 or so. She was rummaging downstairs. I didn't think anything of it. And then, Suddenly, I just heard my mom calling for my dad to come down, and that's when I lowered the volume on my TV. And I could hear the voices weren't any voices I was very familiar with. And so I was scared and I couldn't move. I just sat in my room for a while. The guy was there and he came at me and had string in his hand. Take your time. Take your time. All this is very important, so take your time. They dragged me down the stairs and made me kneel at the bottom, telling me to face down on the floor while the other guy had a gun behind my head and asked my mom where her purse was. My mom kept trying to get up, and they kept telling her, sit down. They took me up the stairs, and they tied me to the top of the banister. The last thing I heard them say was, you lied, you lied to us, you lied to us. And then I heard two pops. My mom screamed. Most people, uh, when they've been witness to a traumatic experience, such as the attempted killing of a parent, are very traumatized, can't remember things, and over time, they start to recall more and more information. She apparently, according to the police, had a ready-made story. She knew all the answers to the questions. That straight away makes people suspicious of her. During a witness interview, if you have suspicions in the back of your mind that this person may be, have a, a role in the offence, um, you have to caution them under, under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. And if you do, you then have to stop that interview and re-interview them as a suspect. So it's a great balancing act to get as much as you can from them as a witness without tipping over into the suspect part of the investigation. What do you see of this guy? So and I'm calling think, him a guy because you said you, you thought they were I all I think males. they were all three males. Okay, so tell me about this guy. Uh, he was medium build. Okay. I didn't, I don't remember any of his clothing, unfortunately. The only thing I can remember was him was he had dreadlocks. He had dreadlocks. So are you, uh, it, can you describe his race to me? He was black. When the police arrived, they found Jennifer upstairs in a bedroom and they released her from the bonds that were, were tying her up and started talking to her. The medical staff were in attendance downstairs and obviously the crime scene was sealed off. 
Officers attending the scene thought it was a bit strange. They thought there was something suspicious immediately. Simple fact of the matter that she had been alienated from the attack made it stand out as suspicious. Why was she not shot like the, her parents? Why was she taken upstairs? The second thing, of course, that come to their nature was her hands were tied behind her back, bound behind her back, and she made a 999 call or 911 call to the police, an emergency service call. And they asked her to reenact that, and she couldn't do it. It was impossible. The other thing that Jennifer was not aware of was her father surviving the attack. And when the police went to investigate or interview her father once he was recovered, he told an altogether different story from that Jennifer had told. He told how Jennifer had been acquiescing with the attackers. It wasn't a scared little girl or a scared woman who was frightened for her life. She'd been interacting and walking around the, the mother's dead body, and he'd seen it, his own daughter, his own flesh and blood, there, basically out to murder them. I'm here with Professor Michael Brooks. As a former prison psychologist, he's experienced firsthand the lengths of deception that murderers will go to in order to deny their crimes. Michael, what did you make of that part of the interview? Well, I, I think they'd have worked out that um, she's very involved in the crime, regardless of whether or not um, her father had lived. It's very unusual for there to be um, an assault on only two people when there's three in the house. So you'd have expected her to have sustained some injuries, and the fact that she didn't would lead um, the police to ask those questions. And it then depends upon the interviewing technique that you want to take. Do you just um, let the person that you're interviewing continue with that narrative, or at some point you, you present some alternative information? With Pan's initial interview completed, the police decide that her next one is going to be radically different. She's no longer a victim in the eyes of the law, rather, She's their lead suspect. Jennifer is about to be confronted with a dramatic shift in interview style. Enter Detective Bill Gader Geetz. Jennifer's responses are muffled by sobbing each time her mother is mentioned. But rather than console her, Geetz nonchalantly but sternly tells her to speak up. Geetz is not only an expert at detecting deception, he says, but is also well-versed at coaxing information from those who otherwise try to deceive the police. In Jennifer's case, he spends the next two hours gaining her trust. Once that stage is complete, he turns the tables, using the goodwill and familiarity he's built up with her to secure a confession. Detectives were now convinced that Pan was lying, so in their bid to gain a confession, there was a shift in their approach. Police were about to use the Reed technique, a tactic so controversial it's been outlawed in many other countries because of the risk of false confession. The suspect knows that they are a suspect for a start, so they start off in a guarded, in a more guarded mode they would have been told that they've been arrested on suspicion of this murder, so they know just how deep they are in. So then, it's a frantic effort on their part to either mitigate or deny. Enter Detective Bill Gator Geetz, one of the force's most feared and revered interrogators. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm here today, okay, is that I'm an expert in what we call truth verification. Okay, I'm not a homicide detective. Okay, although I work on a lot of homicides. Basically, all my studies come into interviewing and detecting deception, determine if somebody's telling the police the truth. I talk to thousands of people, okay? And I basically know when somebody's not being straightforward with me. 
and people are trained to speak in a certain language, okay? And when they are not being truthful, that shows up in their language. They don't even know they're doing it, okay? We have computer programs. And based on what they say, it will tell us where the areas of deception are. It has data from thousands of cases, right? And people follow patterns, okay? And when things go outside of a normal pattern, that's a red flag. And at this point, Jennifer, I know that you've not been truthful with the police. The officer comes in with a great deal of kidology and pretends to tell her that he knows when she's lying and that he's an expert in, in lie detection. Now we know from all the research worldwide that most police officers aren't that good at detecting lies. But somebody walking in and saying, I'm an expert, I can tell you you've been lying, is kidology. But from what we know in the case, it worked. And you've got to admire the police officer for having the gumption to do that. I'm an expert in what we call truth verification. Well, wow. We've got every major read technique exaggeration going in here. Within the read technique, detectives are allowed to lie to the person that's suspected of having committed a crime. Uh, but ethically, Michael, he may be lying, but if that gets a result, why should we be concerned by that? Well, because it depends upon what moral stance you want to take in your interviewing style. And uh, as an inter in interviewer, it's not a style that, that I would adopt. I think in, in many ways, um, if the person wants to tell you their story and, and, and confess, then they will do that. And uh, the, the, the role is to be able to um, create the setting in which somebody feels comfortable enough to be able to um, disclose that information. I will meet people all the time that will tell me they're a great judge of whether or not somebody's telling the truth or whether they're lying. And often, how they'll base their understanding of that is whether the person's looking up and to the right or down and to the left, or if they're perhaps self-grooming or if they refuse to make eye contact. You, you know, you're a, you're a great behaviorist. Do those behaviors necessarily tell you anything at all in relation to understanding if the person is lying or telling the truth? Well, that they may or may not, but what you're interested in is, is the behavioural inconsistencies in, in the record and what they're saying. Are they saying perpetually the same thing? Because if, if somebody lies, then there will be variations in the story that they tell. They won't be able to keep the same story consistently. And those are the bits that you want to focus on. You may use sort of the, uh, the non-verbals as guides, as an indicators, but they, you'll then want to follow that up in terms of um, the conversation that you're having. You've not told us everything that you know, purposely, okay? And that you've left information out, okay? There's a number of inconsistencies in what you've told the police. One of the things you have to remember is that your dad was there, okay? And your dad had a front row seat to all of this. It's an old-fashioned style, um, I, would, I would term it. Um, the trouble is, with, with a style like that, if you start off that way, there's no going back. You can't then undo it and try and play a sympathy card. You're, you're stuck in that mode. So you, it makes it very rigid. I know that you've not been truthful with the police. This is not an interview technique, this is interrogation. And we always have to, I think, um, question the efficacy of interrogation and do you really get the information that you want or are there alternative ways of drawing out um, information from the person that you're interviewing. And in relation to where we are at the moment though, Detective Geats is just looking at the rubbing points, the parts that don't quite add up for him in terms of the story that Jennifer Pan wants to tell. And in particular, how would she be able to make a telephone call given that she was supposedly tied up? And I think that's perfectly legitimate. In any interview, you want to try and um, 
ascertain whether or not the story that the person that you're interviewing is telling matches up to the facts. And Michael, when you've interviewed offenders in the past, how do you approach that interview? In a much more exploratory way and wanting to make sense of the disconnects between what the person is saying and what's on the record. But what if, because of course people will listen to this and they'll say, well, what if the, the offender doesn't want to talk to you at all in, in terms of the kinds of information that you're seeking to extract from them? Well, if the, if, the, if the interviewee doesn't want to tell their story, then there's not much point putting it, pushing it until they're ready to talk. But sometimes people want to understand their own behaviours. Why did I do this? They, they don't always fully understand um, their actions. Everything she had done was a failure. Everything she said was a disappointment to her, predominantly her father. She had come to the point where she could be free of them. And sadly, that is the choice that she took. There were other choices, but she didn't have in her personality and in her life experiences those choices. We have to make crucial choices, and she had not been armed with the capacity and the confidence and the self-assurance to return to a real life, a normal life. The only way she could escape that in her mind was extreme prejudice and the termination of her parents' life. Jennifer turned to someone she already knew and this individual had boasted to her that he had intended to kill his own parents and in Jennifer's eyes that made him a prime candidate for someone to kill her parents and so she gave him money and she asked that he make it look like a robbery gone wrong or a targeted incident in which her parents would be killed and she would be left alive. Once they were dead, that would allow her to inherit their fortune and then she and her boyfriend could live a happily ever after kind of life. I mean, most people would, would either say, look, mum and dad, I can't deal with this pressure anymore. I've been lying to you for, you know, years. Um, and then you deal with it as a family. But obviously the family dynamics were such that she didn't see that as an option, or she chose it not to be an option. Well, I don't think she had the means. I don't think she had the maturity, the independence, the, the set of skills and knowledge that what it would take to. I think she had long since lost any sense of herself. She had been living this lie, this parallel life. She wanted a future without her parents. She wanted a future with her lover, however sad and too late that was. Um, and I don't think she had the skill set necessary. It's hard enough for normal children to leave home. This was a case of terrible dependency on her parents. And I don't think there was in her a real Jennifer Pan. You lied, you lied to it, you lied to it. Why do children try to kill their parents? Why would she want to engage in that kind of behavior? Well, I think that there's two elements. The first is that, um, according to, to one account, that um, she hired other people before that, but for just for a, a small amount. And then she went back to her boyfriend, and, and at some point, um, the idea of inheriting uh, the money that her parents had came into play. So inheriting the money for instrumental reasons. She's killing them for instrumental well, rather than psychological well, that's reasons. A, that's a, I think it becomes more complex because that's the second part of, of the story. For the first part, it was just um, killing her parents um, and uh, at some way of resolving the conflict that was in, within herself or having to perpetually lie about um, what she was doing and then being found out. How does she deal with that? to then going back to her boyfriend and it then moving on to saying, actually, we'll hire somebody professionally to do it and we might be able to inherit the money as well. So I, I think the, the story is much more complex um, than sort of it, it appears on the, on the surface. 
So they, we've got a web of different things going on here, and so let's try and break them down. We've got the idea that she's constantly having to lie to maintain this fiction that she's more successful than she actually is. Which then gets exposed. And therefore, killing her parents is a way of resolving the fact that that fiction is seen at last for what it is, simply a lie. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Uh, and at some point, when she has that f further dialogues with her boyfriend, it then moves on to saying, well, actually, if we can't get somebody that we know to, to kill my parents for a relatively small amount, at some point, and, and we haven't got the background to this, comes out that the picture of then saying, well, actually, we can in inherit some money as well. So if we're going to in inherit some money, then we can actually afford some professional hitmen to do the job. After his initial bluntness, Geats changes tack. He eases back in his chair, drops the cop speak, and focuses attention solely on Jennifer, making her bleak outlook appear rosier. The read technique requires officers to reinforce sincerity to ensure the suspect is receptive to their overtures. Hence, Geats shares with Jennifer his own experiences. When he reminisces about his time playing the piano, he inaccurately refers to the ballet Swan Lake as swans on the lake. The conversation focuses not only on her achievements, but her struggles, as if she's reminiscing with someone who really understands what she's been through. But his empathy doesn't last. The conversation slowly shifts back to her behaviour in the lead-up to and on the night of the murder. Who knows what goes through people's minds in, the, in these states? It's, it's, it's an extreme state. We mustn't forget, although they are, some of them, terrible people, they've committed terrible crimes, they do have the same feelings as everybody. So you can appeal to their sympathetic nature, you can appeal to their honour, you can appeal to their family background, and there will be a reaction. Just because they've committed a heinous offence doesn't mean to say that they don't react that way. And they try this process whereby they say to her, look, we're on your side, you were an abused young woman, why wasn't it good enough that you, you could, you know, you could be a piano teacher, not a doctor, you know, anyone would crack in your situation, but you've got to tell us what happened. You helped, sort, you helped set this up, so you've got to come clean on this. You need to tell me what went on, because you know who was in that house that night. You, you do, Jen, there's no question about that, okay? You have actually given an improper description of the person you were dealing with. You falsified the whole description of that person. Be honest with me, Jen. Give me that. All right? Look at me, Jen. Let's be honest with each other. Now, I do a lot of reading. And over 300 kids in North America every year are involved in the parents' deaths, okay? And when we look into those cases, there's always a common factor, that those kids have had to live up to expectations that weren't reasonable, that they weren't being treated the way human beings should be treated. You have spent your whole life trying to live up to expectations that you can't meet and it's stressed the hell out of you. You're a 24-year-old woman being treated like a 15-year-old. It doesn't feel good, does it? Jen? It doesn't feel good to have secrets, does it? No. But I can tell you one thing is that we already know, so you can't change that. Then why did you stop? I know you did. Let's get back to how they got there, why they got there, okay? But what happened to me? Well, I don't know at this point. But I can tell you one thing, I'm gonna sit here as long as it takes for you to get this off your chest, okay? 
Do you know what I mean? Do it. What's that? Okay, that's good to hear. That's so positive. We know that you weren't the one that pulled the trigger. We know that. Something we can have to be honest with each other. Michael, uh, this clip really reveals a great deal about the interviewing technique of the detective. It's almost as if he plays good cop and bad cop at the same time. And what we're seeing is actually, in this particular case, it's not effective that you needed a, a continuity of style. And that switching style leads, leads to confusion. One of the things that we should make clear is that this technique is the technique that's taught to Canadian and indeed American detectives to this day. What is it for you that's inconsistent and not helpful, given the fact that ultimately Jennifer Pan is going to be found guilty of the murder, an attempted murder? Well, well it's, not, it, it's only helpful if you get the information that's, that you're wanting, or if, if, if you're being able to answer the questions that you have that you're inquiring about. And actually, if it's leaving somebody confused, um, then actually it's not um, being successful in fulfilling your objectives of answering uh, the queries that you have. And there's a danger with, with that technique is that at some point, if somebody feels so intimidated, they all just go along and say whatever you want them to say just to end, um, the, as you used earlier, the word interrogation. So what he's trying to do, Detective Geetz is trying to do, he's testing out information that she's telling. He's trying to make her feel relaxed and then trying to make her feel uncomfortable. So this idea of going back and forth, relaxing and then putting the person under pressure, does that not work in your experience? Well, it all depends upon the person that you're working with and you have to vary your technique according to who it is that you're interviewing. So there is never one standard approach which works for every individual. Everybody is, is different, everybody is unique, everybody needs to be approached in a different way and you need to have a range of um, techniques and skills which you call upon and which you utilise in that particular moment when you're interviewing somebody. So it, it relies a lot upon professional judgement rather than just adherence to a script about saying this is the way that you do it. It, will, it may well work in some situations but it may well not work in others. Any hopes Pan may have had of gaining the confidence of Geetz are dashed when he sheds his friendly and engaging demeanor and begins to become assertive. Step one of the re-technique, direct confrontation. The re-technique clearly states that an interrogator must try and discourage the suspect from denying his or her guilt. True to form, Geetz refuses to let Jennifer get a word in edgeways. She speaks little for the following 60 minutes, but he eventually offers her a way out. As Geetz begins to accuse Jennifer, he inches his chair closer and closer to her until the pair are almost touching, his burly stature bearing down on her. He warns, you're involved in this, I know that. The results he gains are astonishing and will condemn Pan for the crime of matricide. And in the final moments, he brings Pan as close to confession as her sense of honor and shame will ever allow. Okay, you need to tell me how you got involved in this. We know that, Jen. You wanna be a part of the solution? Not the problem? Do you want to be a part of the solution here? Jen? Okay. What do you think should happen? What would you like to see happen in this case? What's that? Justice for your mom. Okay. Not if I could stop it, I would have stopped it. Okay. Did you try to stop it that night? Yes. How? I wanted to go be with my parents. I wanted to go be with them. You want to be a part of the solution, not the problem? I particularly like the idea that Jennifer Pan is in a seat very much like ours that's in one particular position 
But Detective Geetz's chair is on wheels. He can get closer and closer and closer to the person that he's interviewing. What, what does that do? When he physically becomes closer to the person that he's interviewing, what is that serving to help reveal? Well, it all depends upon the person and their reaction to somebody coming closer to them and whether or not they feel intimidated. Some will um, just capitulate, others will become uh, more resolved and um, argumentative, perhaps, in, in that wa not wanting to, to actually in engage and finding a challenge and will push back. But will there, some people might react by seeing that closing of the space as making a more intimate environment and that intimacy might facilitate greater confession. Well, it might or it might not. It depends all upon the person's um, personal space boundary. Um, different people have different personal space boundaries. So some are quite, individuals are quite happy for in, other individuals to come quite close to them. Others aren't. Um, but it is sort of a, a risky technique. You have to be able to judge how close to get. Hmm? Why didn't they stop for you? Hmm? I don't know who they were. You have to tell me that part, and then we're going to work through it together. So you're supposed to take the whole family in? No, just me. Okay, so tell me how that happened then. I don't know. Why did it change? I don't know. Okay, what do you know? How come it was supposed to be you? <laughs> so deeply entrenched uh, is Pan's sense of shame, uh, a sense of needing to avoid shame, um, that even faced with incontrovertible evidence, uh, she still will not admit to her parents' murder. Um, uh, to admit to it would, would, would be essentially self-destruction. It's the same intensity of a sense of shame that we see here at the end of this story as actually w was the initial um, motivator, the sense of shame in her lack of achievement um, and not being able to face up to that, face up to her parents, is exactly, she's, she's, uh, it's that same emotion that drove the murder that we're seeing again here now. There's a bitterness, possibly, in the realization that the wrong parent died. And that's quite telling, because her father was her tyrannical tormentor that she could never satisfy. And she probably was genuinely grieving for her mother. And I believe that. Um, and although you can never uh, mitigate to any significance, her culpability, you can still understand and have some compassion when you reflect on the life she lost early and never had. I think for a lot of people, it's very difficult for them to actually admit they want somebody to be killed. And in this case, it's easier for her to say, oh, I'm the target and they're fixating on me and they got it wrong, rather than say she's actually encouraged other people to kill her parents. And it's this dis disconnection because quite clearly they didn't come to kill her. They made no attempt to do her any harm. They clearly came in to do harm to the parents. There's no way she can justify that or rationalise it because clearly that's not what happened. This, this isn't the straightforward case of, of just a, a kid that's gone wrong. This is the straightforward case of murder, ultimately. But when you start looking at the antecedents of the family and looking at the family background and the cultural and diversity aspect of that family and that group, it was pressure, it was absolute stress that that girl was living under. So this isn't just about something that's gone wrong and it's a, an act of aggression in revenge. This is about the girl feeling an absolute failure with no, no, no effort left in her life to do anything else. She knew she couldn't succeed. So the only thing she could do was get rid of the parents in order that she could at least move on or deny that shame on the family. It's, it's, it would be iniquitous to say 
that this is a product of the tyranny of a parent or parents. But this young woman does not strike me as being a murderer. Um, and yet she was, and there's no getting away from that. And I do believe that she had an ulterior motive of, of finan insurance, financial rewards as well. And in that sense, she's culpable. I think that was part of her motivation. Um, but the dynamic here of central impact is the father-daughter. And um, there has to be some burden of responsibility on the father.